Welcome back to Quilter's Adventures podcast, where we discuss and talk about everything quilting, embroidery, needlework, and crafting in general. So just create with fabric and floss. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about silk embroidery. The art of silk embroidery requires much taste and skill to produce. Said by Saint Aubin, the French master embroiderer in the 1770s. And this technique was certainly a most exacting form of needlework. The cloth chosen had to be stretched perfectly in the frame so that an even tension stitch could be achieved. Stitches were uniformly and artistically arranged to suggest form and shape plus any naturalism required in the design. Shaped embroidery used long and short stitches was probably the most popular technique and St. Auburn was quite sincere when he said the art of blending shades to make a light and curvature apparent apparent is not an easy art. So have you practiced the long and short stitch to blend colors? Colors were selected so that they blended into one another without a sudden change in shade or tone. They had to be kept in order so that the worker did not pick up the wrong thread by mistake. And it was also important to avoid touching the silk thread with your fingers or the thimble. As these could dull the luster. In fact, the longest particular stitch was invariable used to enhance the glossy qualities of the silk thread. The colors chosen were supposed to be those seen in nature, not garnished or harsh, and shadows were not to appear on large dark shapes, but were to enhance form and three-dimensional effects. Other stitches used with the long and short shading were stems and chain for single lines or work close together as a filling. French and bullion knots were used as a dot, dot texture or cluster of centers of fabric flowers. Oh my goodness, it is hard to talk today. Straight fly, herringbone, cretin were worked as borders, lines, and filling variations, while thicker threads were couched in trellis and other laid work designs. Silk embroidery on velvet. There were many surviving examples of the 18th century embroidery on velvet. The sheen of silk threads against the matte velvet produced a sumptuous and rich effect. Oh, I could only imagine how beautiful that work was. I would love to see it in person and not just in photographs. However, a problem that could occur when embroidering velvet was that the stitches could become lost in the pile of fabric. In the 18th century, the embroiderer had an ingenious method of overcoming this though. The design was drawn onto a transparent silk gauze by placing the gauze directly over the paper design and then tracing it with pen and ink. The color of the gauze would tone with the velvet to be used. For example, black for dark velvets and buff or gray for mid-tones. The velvet marked with the shapes of the garment pieces would be mounted in the frame. The gauze was tacked in position along borders, pocket flaps, cuffs, or wherever else was required. The silk embroidery was then worked through both layers and the silk layer prevented the stitches being obscured by the pile. When the embroidery was complete, the surplus gauze was cut away. The gauze appears in some cases to have been quite brittle 
and possibly been coated with a thin layer of glue. In this instance, the gauze could have been torn away along the needle perforations made by the close satin stitch as the work progressed. Have you ever worked with velvet, embroidered on velvet? I have not, um, but it may be something to try and see what can come out of it. So I hope you enjoyed this one on silk embroidery. I know it's short, but you know, sometimes the topic isn't very long. So let me know if you have tried silk embroidery. One technique I would like to try is the silk ribbon embroidery. So if you've done that, leave some comments and suggestions below that I may be able to try myself. Until then, happy stitching, my friends. <laughs>